Glory to God. Did you bring your Bibles? All right, let's make our declaration this morning. Are you ready? Say it with me. This is my Bible. I live by its truth. I walk in its light. I rest in its promises. I'm empowered by its love. And I overcome by receiving (laughs) in my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. By the faith produced from receiving this seed. Amen. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for all that you desire to do in us and through us. For your glory in Jesus' name. And somebody said? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, before we get to the cover of your outline, I want to read something to you. And uh, a little, I went back through a lot of my old notes, but I found this in one of my old binders. And it said this, it just said, do more. Do more than exist, live. Do more than hear, listen. Do more than agree, cooperate. Do more than talk, communicate. Do more than grow, bloom. Do more than spend, invest. Do more than think, create. Do more than work, excel. Do more than share, give. Do more than decide, discern. Do more than, do more than consider, commit. Do more than forgive, forget. Do more than help, serve. Do more than coexist, reconcile. Do more than sing, worship. Do more than think, plan. Do more than dream, do. Do more than see, perceive. Do more than read, apply. Do more than receive, reciprocate. Do more than choose, focus. Do more than wish, believe. Do more than advise, help. Do more than speak, impart. Do more than encourage, inspire. Do more than add, multiply. Do more than change, improve. Do more than reach, stretch. Do more than ponder, pray. Do more than just live. Live for Jesus. Amen? Amen? So make the day, today the day you decide to be somebody who does more. Praise the Lord. Amen. And then don't forget, Pastor said, next Sunday we're going to be praying together and that. But before we dive into this, I, I'm, I'm taking this to the next level. We've been ministering on no longer being naked and afraid, no longer listening to the wrong voice and eating from the wrong tree. And ended up with the wrong response in life. And so the next level of this is really to break down and where we left off talking about the life of God in us a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, before we went on vacation and before Brother John came to be with us and that. And so it was actually three weeks ago. But I want to pick up off of that and begin to build from there on our understanding of the principle of seed time and harvest. Everything God does in our life is based upon the principle of seed, time, and harvest. We shared with you, you're born again by an incorruptible seed. That seed is the seed of God's Word. The Word of God is referred to as seed. Our life is referred to as soil, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself right here. So we're going to spend the next several weeks just breaking this down completely. Uh, Some things you'll hear, you're going to hear things a little bit said, the same thing said a little bit differently, but we need to get this down on the inside of it. When Jesus taught the parable of the sower, the sower sowing the word into the hearts and lives, uh, uh, into our hearts and lives, he said, if we don't understand this parable, we won't understand anything else. So understanding seed, soil, and harvest is so important in our life. Now, let me just say this to you. We are all students in the school of life. Every one of you is a student in the school of life. And we are daily tested to see what we have learned. Every day you live under a test to see how well you're learning. Most people have dropped out of learning a long time ago. You've met a lot of people. They're no longer teachable. They don't care about what they hear. They're fixed. They're locked in. That's it. And they're as smart as they're ever going to be. Amen. People ask me, well, when are you going to be done? I said, I don't want to be done. I'm in my prime. I'm smarter than I've ever been. Amen. I've never been this smart before in my life. I got smarter this morning. (laughs) Amen. So think about this. So we're daily tested to see what we have learned. Our diligence and willingness to learn determines if we pass the test. Every day. There's no age where you're immune from no longer having to learn. There's no place, there's no stage or stature in life that you get that you no longer need to learn. How many know the older you get, the things you have to deal with are different? 
So you need to learn how to rightly process and deal with the things that come along with age and youth and everything else. Emma's going on this mission trip, young people taking out, getting on their own adventure, going out. My son Cody, I laugh all the time because I tried to get him to be involved when I was doing projects. He goes, I don't need to learn about that. I'll make a lot of money and hire somebody. Well, now he calls me up all the time. Most of the time when he calls, because something's broken, and needs to know how to fix it. So I have to do a FaceTime. How do I hang this? How do I do that? But now that he's on his own, he's learning. Are you doing all right? And so we all go through that process where we learn, where we grow, and continually growing. And so, but what happens is, is most of us drop out. Most people drop out because they are no longer teachable or feel that they are smarter than the teacher. What happens is when we're smarter than the teacher, and when we know as much as the teacher, when people, nobody can, can teach me any longer, or I, I can teach myself, amen. But if that was true, then God wouldn't have given us the gift of teachers into our lives if we could teach ourselves. And so in dealing with that, so it's so important. So the next few weeks, we're just going to be teaching, and I want to encourage you to be diligent and be a student. The one reason I print out outline is because you don't get everything I say. Some of you read ahead and you're studying the outline, not even listening to what I'm saying. Amen. Don't look at that person. You know who they are. Amen. So anyway, it's important. I love this quote by Leo Rostin, and he said, Leo Calvin Rostin, he says this on the cover of your outline. I cannot believe that the purpose of life is to be happy. One of my favorite quotes. I think the purpose of life is to be useful, to be responsible, to be compassionate. It is above all to matter. We live in a world that just wants to be happy. Make everybody happy. That doesn't make me happy. That doesn't make me feel good. People protesting about the, the, you know, the, the, the name of our town, Placerville being Hangtown. That doesn't make me happy. Hey, I don't care. Move. Our job, is, life is not about making you happy. There's a really funny meme the other day. If I'm supposed to do all this to make you happy, you want me to jog so you lose weight too? I mean, no, that won't happen. Amen. I won't jog for anybody, let alone myself. Amen. So watch this. It is above all to matter to stand for something, to have have made some difference that you lived at all. Every one of us, our life is supposed to make a difference because we live. And we're going to break that down. And I'm going to show you that God ordained that you would make a difference. That every life has purpose and has a, a reason for being. God creates nothing without purpose. And it is important that we find out how to live and fulfill our purpose in life. Amen? Now, I, I have a lot of introduction scriptures there, but I'm not going to go through all them. I'm just going to give you a highlight on each of them. And guys, you don't need to try to put them up to keep up with me. But in Genesis chapter 1, well, first before we do that, turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Because this is really foundational. Beginning in verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip who was from Bethsaida of Galilee and asked him saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew and Andrew in turn and, uh, in turn, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. 
Or in other words, Jesus is saying this. He says, my life is here to be sown as a seed to produce the harvest of redemption for all of humanity. And you and I, when we begin to understand that, God has placed an assignment on the inside of it, just like inside of a seed, as we're going to see. And it's so important for us to walk by and understand and live by this principle. Now watch this. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, the Lord says, Let the earth bring forth, and the earth brought forth. The earth was created to receive seed and place a demand upon it to bring forth what it contained. Hear me. Seed contained the power within it to produce in response to the demand. I'm reading you notes that aren't in your notes, so you have to listen to me and not try to read and find what I'm saying. So it's important. Now why? So the, the earth places the demand on soil to produce what it contains. That's what Genesis tells us. In Genesis 2, think about this. God formed man out of the dust of the earth. So God creates the earth. He creates it to receive seed and to cause that seed to produce. And then God forms you out of that same substance. He forms you out of third-day soil. And the purpose of forming you out of third-day soil is so He can sow His seed of life into you. And your life as soil will now make a demand on that seed to produce what it contains. And it contains the very life of God. Hallelujah. That's what we gave you a few weeks ago. That every seed reproduces after its own kind. So if I've received God's seed, the seed of His life, what is it going to produce in me? His life, His nature. That's why Peter says we've been made partakers of the divine nature. Then in Genesis 2, verses 19 through 20, we find Adam. And in him was the wisdom to name every living creature. Watch it. God created Adam, and then he brings every living thing before him and says, hey, name it. So the wisdom to do that, God put in him. John Muncy and I talked one time. I said, I said, hey, John, where did Adam learn how to name everything? Where did he get that knowledge on, on how to name or know how to do that? That wisdom was in him. God put that in you. Let me just tell you this. There's more in you than you realize. God has put more in you than you can even comprehend when he created you. Hallelujah. In Genesis 8, God said from now on that we will live under the law of seed, time, and harvest. We live under the law and the principle of seed, Time and harvest that governs your life completely. Amen. Now think about this. In Genesis, Colossians chapter 1. In fact, guys, you could put this up. Colossians 1 verses 4 through 6 if you pull it up. Man's greatest uh, faux pas or blunder is trying to get what he already has on the inside of us. We live trying to get something from the outside when we have everything inside. Colossians chapter 1. You got it? Colossians chapter 1. No, Colossians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. If you can put it up in the Amplified, there you go. God bless you. Look at For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, the leaning, of your, the leaning of your entire human personality upon him in absolute trust and confidence in his power and wisdom and goodness. Is that how you're saved? Leaning on him in absolute trust. Look at that. Of his in confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness, and the love which you have and show for all the saints, God's consecrated one. Next verse. Because of the hope of experiencing what is laid up, reserved, and waiting for you in heaven, of this hope you heard in the past in the message of the truth of the gospel. Now look at verse 6. Which has come to you indeed, and in the whole world, that gospel is bearing fruit and is still growing. By its own inherent power. The gospel is the seed of the word. It's God's word declared in seed form. They received it. Look at what he said. You received the word of the gospel. And now it's growing in you. And it's producing not by anything you're added to it. When you received it, it went into the soil of your heart. And that soil began to place a demand on it. And now it's producing what it contained. The life of God on the inside of you. Glory to God. Now look at that. 
And so it's there, every, uh, even as it is done among yourselves, even since the day you first heard and came to know and understand the grace of God in truth, you came to know the grace or the undeserved favor of God in reality, deeply and clearly and thoroughly, becoming accurately and intimately acquainted with this. Or in other words, like that, hey, dirt, you know what, uh, pe- people say, well, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. I'm just old dirt. I'm the-. Yes, you were completely undeserved favor, but God has planted his life on the inside of you. Amen. And it's his life that we're agreeing with. So look at the bottom of the the next part in here. John 12, 24, we read, the seed has to fall on the ground and die. 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 38, you can read it. It talks about the transformation of harvest and we'll get into it. How many know when you sow a seed, what you sow is not what comes out? It's transformed, and that's what we need. we'll dive into a little bit more in the future, the transformation of Harvard. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 23, that you and I are born again by an incorruptible seed. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. So I receive seed, and now what's growing is there's a new man growing on the inside of me. Paul said it like this, though my outward man is perishing, when you put a seed into the ground, what happens? That outer shell begins to fall off, and then that new life begins to spring up. Paul says, though my outward man is perishing, my inward man is being renewed day by day. Some of you would feel a lot better every day when you get up if you just agree that there's a new man on the inside of you instead of being so concerned about your old shell. Well, my old shell's getting hard, crusty, and old. Yes, it is, but there's new life on the inside of you. So let that new life transform the way you look at life. Glory to God. Amen. So now watch this. Psalm 92 through 12 through 15 says that we're to be, they, they that are planted in the house of their God, those who are planted in the house of their God shall still flourish and bring forth fruit in old age. Amen. I'm in my fruit bearing season myself. Amen. If you want to wither up and die, God bless you. Amen. I refuse. Amen. And I, and I can based on the word. Psalms 1 verses 3, that, that blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the, or, or, or sits in the seat of the scornful, walks in the way of sinners. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. Amen. That's who you are. You're a living tree planted by the river of God. John 15, 16, Jesus said this, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to bear much fruit. God expects harvest from our life. He expects harvest and increase from our life. Now, let me give you this. Mark 11, and these are all the scriptures that are there in red on your outline. Mark 11, 12 through 14, Jesus goes to a fruit tree. Watch it. He goes to a fruit tree expecting to find fruit. Which exposes the myth of faithfulness or fruitfulness, which is God looking for. Well, I'm I'm just a tree. I'm planted here. I don't produce anything, but I'm faithfully growing. Jesus wasn't satisfied with the oak tree being alive and being faithful and growing. He expected to find fruit. And when when the word says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? He will faith. Faith produces the harvest of God's word. God is expecting to find. This is what Jesus said. I called you and appointed you to bear much fruit. Not just to grow. Not just to flourish. Not to, just to be a nice looking Christian plant. Look at all my little bushes. But they're all barren. Jesus doesn't want barren plants. He's looking for fruitful trees. Amen. And so in your life and ours, it has to be there. And then Mark 4 is the parable of the sower. If you have room in your outline there, find some room. I'm going to give you three things before we dive into part of this message this morning. Right, I want, these are three keys to receive. If you don't get this, you won't receive anything. Three keys to receive. The number one key to receiving is how you receive the man of God. In order for you to receive, you have to learn how to receive men and women of God into your life. Utmost. Because God sends men and women to people to bring his word to them. So you have to learn how to receive the man of God. Secondly, you have to learn how to receive the word of God. 
If you can't receive the man of God, you won't receive the word of God. You read your Old Testament. How did God speak to the nation of Israel? Through prophets. He sent men to them. And if they didn't receive a prophet, they didn't receive the word. What was the consequence? It wasn't good. Because they didn't receive the man, they didn't receive the word. Because they didn't receive the word and the man, they didn't receive their answer. So they ended up in peril. So what happens to us today? So you hang around with me. If you make a demand on the gift that's on the inside of me, that gift will produce. If you just want to hang out with me, I'm pretty squirrely. I, I have areas just like you. I'm not that saved. I, I'm, I'm a work in progress. Amen. So I say stupid stuff. I'll do stupid stuff. I'm very sarcastic in the natural. Actually, it's a gift. Amen. Amen. John was cracking up. I, I went Wednesday night. In fact, I'm going to have a talk with John George. John, if you're watching this, I, I, I'll have a talk with you later. But I said, man, I'm going to go with him. He went down to preach for a friend of ours, Mark Butler, in uh, Stockton. I said, well, I'll ride down with you. It's late. You know, I'll keep you some company coming back. You know, I want you to fall asleep coming back. and stuff. So I get down there. Any, anyone guess how long he preached in Stockton? Oh, no. Oh, no. Want to guess again? Four hours. No. You want to guess again? Forty minutes. That's what I said. <laughs> and then I, I just figured the Lord was helping me because nobody will ever be able to call me long-winded again. Amen. <laughs> now, Pastor, you just go too long. No, no, no. I preach sermonettes. Hallelujah. So now watch this. So in that, so how you receive the man of God determines how you receive the word of God. Amen. And number three, number three, number three. How you protect your heart from the seed of the enemy. How you guard your heart from the seed of the enemy. And we'll get to that. The devil always comes to offer counterfeit soil and counterfeit seed. Amen. So you have to receive the man of God. You have to receive the word of God. And you have to protect your heart from the seed of the enemy. Those are three keys to receiving the fulfillment of God's word in your life. Now look at the bottom of the cover of your outline there. Our lives are both seed and soil. We are to sow our lives in the soil of his kingdom to produce the harvest and the destiny that has already been placed on the inside of it. Isn't it interesting that when you, I get ready to preach a message like this, and all three words, prophetic words and exhortation that came forth this morning had exactly to do with being sowers. And allowing God's word and his seed to produce harvest through our life. And then as soil, we are to receive the seed of his word planted and sown into the soil of our heart, which produces the harvest of transformation of a transformed life that is able to walk in agreement with his plan and purpose for our life. Here's the challenge. If you don't let the word of God do the transforming work in you, it's really hard to walk in agreement with the word of God. So I have to allow that transformation, that inward chain, to work within our life. Look inside your outline if you would. So here's my question. What will you produce? Here's what's happened in ministry. Most people go to church and expect the pastor to produce everything. But every person, every life that God creates is a divine seed. Amen. God gives you your life in seed form. The question is, why are you here? Or in other words, what on earth was God thinking when he made you? We've all had kids and we asked him, what were you thinking? Oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? So when God made you, when he created you, he was thinking something very specific. He was very specific in his thought concerning you. And he put a specific assignment on the inside of you. You have a divine harvest contained on the inside of your life. And the devil knows that. Amen. The difference is, is some people just go crazy enough to want to find out what it is. So you have to get that. But I want to discover what God put in me for his glory. Amen. So now watch it. Your life is in seed form, and the purpose of God for your life is in you. 
like the fruit of a tree, it will grow out of you when you sow your life in the kingdom of God. Many people today call themselves Christian, but they live their life sowing in the world and come to church and think about God. I could have got a bigger amen there at the Lions Club. Hallelujah. So now watch. I'm going to read you this definition. Dennis Comer wrote this out. I want you to live this, listen to this definition of seeds. Seeds or grains or ripened ovules or eggs of plants used for growing. They are the, listen to this, they are the source of origin and the beginning of life and existence. Seeds are the source of origin and the beginning of life and existence. They are also known as a carrier of life. Amen. Isn't it amazing that, that when God made Adam, he, he divided that up, but, but he made man and woman, and he made man the carrier of the seed, and he made woman the receiver of the seed. Glory to God. Now watch this. So man, listen to me, man, you are the carriers of life. You carry the seed of life. Glory to God. Now listen, seeds speak of predestination. My little bean seeds, this seed is predestined to produce beans. No matter what else it thinks it might be, it will never be anything else but a bean seed. And its assignment is already in it. And if it can just find soil, what's in it will come out of it. You know what you are? You're a bean seed. And your assignment is already on the inside of you. And when we truly sow our lives into the soil of his kingdom, you don't have to make anything happen. You don't have to work out. People try to make a ministry. Try. I'm trying. I'm trying. You're not called to try to do anything. You're called to let life grow out of you. It's supposed to flow out of you. It's all the things we try to do for God. God never asked us to try to do anything for him. He asked us to just sow our lives and what he put in us into the soil of his kingdom. But we come up with all the things that we think we could do to really bless God. We'll get to that in a minute. Amen. So that's why I said, seeds speak of predestination. Everything that a seed will ever be or will ever manifest in its life cycle is already embodied within it. Every attribute, characteristic, expression, the seed is the purest form of predestination. That which is decreed beforehand or foreordained. Paul said it like this, I, Paul, called to be an apostle from my mother's womb. Well, in my, I was called from the place of my conception, from the place where I was formed. God said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 1, before I formed you, I knew you, and I ordained you to be. Before God formed you, he knew you, and he has ordained you to be. Whoo. Amen. Look at your neighbor and just tell him, you're somebody. You are. You're somebody. Listen, young people, listen to me. That's what the world wants to tell you. The world wants to give you an identity. You're born with an identity in God. Man, I wish I would have. I wish I would have yielded to God at your age instead of at 25 through failure. Amen. I could have saved myself a lot of stupid. Amen. Now watch this. Again, it's the purest form. The seed carries within itself a free, a fixed, predestined, unchangeable purpose with tremendous potential. Look at the other side of your neighbor on the other side and say, you have tremendous potential. I'm serious. Yeah, but here's the key. Here's the key. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. Well, isn't a little, am I a little old to get started? 
No, age has nothing to do with it. Age has nothing to do with it. The moment you hear the truth, you're the right age to explode. Amen. You hear me say it all the time. In fact, pa- Patty, my pastor's daughter, uh, uh, com- commented uh, about our building and said, oh, I wish my dad was alive. He'd have been so excited for what, what, what God's doing for you guys. And I said, yeah, he would have told me. He looked at me and said, Don, you know what? You're just the right age to do something great for God. You know what you always are? You're always the right aid to do something great for God. It, it, and, and we always think, see, we're thinking of what we could have done if we still had all of our strength, all of our youth, all of our vitality. Bless God, I still have all of mine. Quit talking, quit talking yourself down. Are you doing all right? Quit talking yourself down. Glory to God. Man, I'm preaching good this morning. So watch this. So, so what happens? The challenge is that disorder comes. Look at the, the cover of your outline, point number B. The challenge is that disorder comes. Listen to me. When I try to produce with my life something that's not in me. Amen. When I try to produce something in my life that God didn't put in me. That's when disorder comes. And then I'm tempted to produce a counterfeit harvest and call it the will of God. Amen. Well, Lord, I, I sense God pulling me. But, you know, I'm just going to go over here and do this because this is a really nice thing to do. And I'm going to offer this up to God instead of what I know that he's calling me to do. Because if I go do what he's calling me to do, I'm going to have to die to myself. I'm going to have to be that grain of wheat that falls into the ground and die. But I don't want to die to all the things I like to do because I don't want to give anything up for God. So I'll do something nice for God and I'll offer that up to him. As a counterfeit harvest, and I'm sure he'll be blessed by this nice thing I offer up to him. That's why Matthew 7 says it like this. In that day, there are many who will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out devils in your name, and do mighty wonderful works in your name? Jesus said, uh, depart from me, I never knew you. Because those things you did were never authorized. I never authorized you to do any of that. That's not what I called you to do. I told you to go over here. I told you to do that. You're trying to offer up something I did not authorize you to do. I don't receive that. You are a lawless person. And so seed is called, and so the most natural thing to do, but you're constantly, that, this is why I said, every, we are students whether we want to be or not, and there's a test every day. And the devil knows it. It, it, Stay with me. Are you doing okay? All right, now watch this. Watch this. So the devil always comes to offer. Well, let me just read this thought to you. See, we call it the will of God. But look at what Jesus said. What, What did Jesus pray in the garden? Not my will, but your will be done. So even Jesus wrestled with asking God, hey, could we figure out another way to do this? But he knew the only way to do it was God's way. And in our life, we keep trying to figure out another way to do it. And learning to submit to the will of God and doing it his way is a way that produces heart. See, when it's my will, if anything I want to do for God that I purpose, that's not his will for my life, the, the, the bill's on me. I have to pay for that. That's why most people, what they do for God is based upon what they have in their hand, not what they have in him. Amen. I'm going to go here. I'm going to live here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. This is what I will be. This is what I'll be. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Blah, blah. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. Every area of our life. Amen. Instead of saying, Lord, what's your will for my life? What do you want to do? You created me. I'm your divine seed in the earth. I want to be planted in the middle of your will. I want to see what you have purpose to bring forth in my life. Amen. Look, look, look at what, Je- what did Jesus say to Peter? Up on this time, you've gone anywhere you want, but there'll be a time in your life where people will take you where you do not want to go, signifying his death. Think about that. Do you know all of the apostles were martyred? See, we want to go out in comfort and glory. The church is finding out in America, everything is as rosy as we thought it was. And now we're perhaps you haven't been called to stand for the convictions of our faith and actually have a voice. 
Glory to God. Amen. So now why? The, so, so why? The devil always comes to offer counterfeit soil to produce a counterfeit harvest. The devil always comes to say, hey, you can sow here and get the same results. You, you can sow in this field. You can sow in this place and get the same hey, This is much better. This would be much easier. You, you'd be so much more productive over here in this nice place, in this place. Then look, look where God wants you to sow. Look where God wants you to go. The, the, look, look, it, it, and, you, and you could go there with God and do that, but you'd be so much more productive over here. No matter what it is in life, whether it's jobs or doing things and doing that, amen. One thing that hinders people in ministry, I'm so thankful for my pastor. When, when we were going to Bible school, our pastor taught us, he said, hey, son, he told the office in school, he says, you need to learn this at the beginning. The ministry is at a disadvantage. If you're going to go into the ministry, there's some things that you'll have to live your life at disadvantage to everybody else. You won't get to live like everybody else in your church. You're going to have to be at a disadvantage. The purpose is so that you bring no reproach upon the ministry. Because even though you could do it, it's not the right thing to you for you to do. Look what happens when God blesses ministers and, and they get extravagantly wealthy and they start doing it. What happens? They bring reproach by their lifestyle and their conduct. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you're supposed to do it. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, that's a side note. Praise the Lord. But even for Christians. So what is a counterfeit? As I get ready to close, what is a counterfeit? It is to imitate. Made in imitation of something else with the intent to deceive. Something likely to be mistaken for something of higher value. An imitation is something that is likely to mistaken, a counterfeit. Something to be mistaken for a higher value. You go to watches or do everything. One thing about a Rolex, if you listen to a real Rolex, you'll never hear it go tick, 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 tick. If you get a Folex... For $25 on the street, it'll go talk, 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 talk. <laughs> Amen. It'll, you, you'll hear it working. But, but, but a, a Rolex, the way they're made, or fine watches and different things, or any different, not just as an example, but there's something, the real thing is different. But the counterfeit or the imitation is made to look like something of higher value. And that's the deception that the enemy always brings. You, you'll have higher value over here than you would with God. Look what you're giving up to serve God. But you always need to realize, we're not just, the kingdom of God is not just sowing. We sow in two worlds. We're sowing in two worlds. When you're sowing into the kingdom, there's a harvest here, but there's a reward in heaven. And we can live for just here, but I want to be connected to both worlds. Are you doing all right? That's how I want to live. Praise the Lord. Now what? So the devil always comes to offer that counterfeit. Temptation. Uh, now, let me just think about this. When you're in God, in Him, you're at your highest value. Our highest value, personally, is always in Him. The world can never give you higher value than God. Amen. Temptation is the greatest, great harvest destroyer. Even Jesus faced temptation of sowing into counterfeit soil for a false harvest. Look what the devil told you. If you're the son of God, took him up on a high mountain, took him up on a high mountain. John, Luke chapter 4, showed him all the kingdoms of the world. All the wealth, the power, the riches of the world. This way he said, all this has been given into my hand. That's what Brother John talked about taught us about giving up our authority. All this has been given into my hands. I've, I've taken all this away from man. Man's given me all this. Man's given me the authority over all this. And I can give it to whoever I wish. If you'll bow down and worship me, if you'll sow into my kingdom, if you'll sow your, no, you, I know God's but if you'll just sow your life into my kingdom, Jesus, I'll, I'll give you all. So he offered Jesus a counterfeit harvest. Showed him everything the world has. That's what the devil, he, he showed you something greater than what you have. 
He gives you great opportunities. And it usually is a choice. It usually costs something to live and say yes to God. It costs us something to live with the yes for God. But if I live with the yes for God, God's harvest is always better. Amen. The, the, the psalmist said it like this. The blessing of the Lord brings increase, but it adds no sorrow with it. God brings increase. How many, how many, people, how many wealthy people in our world have sorrow? How many entertainers and athletes and people, their lives are destroyed because they have the promise of the world, but they have sorrow and they're discouraged and they're on drugs and they, they die prematurely. Are you doing all right? God brings no sorrow. So let me just break this down a little bit in just a couple more minutes. Your pre-planned harvest and purpose in God is connected to the fulfillment of His eternal plan. This is where I want you to get this this morning. God has an eternal plan, and he sent you and I here to do it. You know something? You arrived on time. I remember uh, Jay was asking me, he said, well, we're in labor. When's he going to get here? I said, when he's done. <laughs> Babies come out when they're done. Doing all right? Some of them come out. But, but see, look, when something comes out prematurely, we know that's not normal and it's a concern, so we have to give it special care. We have to nurture and care for it. So God doesn't want us to birth things prematurely. Amen. Amen. But learning how to wait for that. So God has an eternal plan and purpose. Now get this. Underline this in your outline. The devil knows it and is out to abort it any way he can. The devil knows that God is birthing his purpose into the earth. How's he doing that? Through you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, through the assignment that he put inside of you. God said, I'm going to bring my purpose to path in the earth through my people. Everything God is doing in the earth, he's doing through the lives of his children. The devil knows that. And he knows the only way to stop the plan of God is to attack the harvest that he knows is on the inside of you. Are you with me today? So when he comes against you, he's not coming against you. Grow up and quit taking it personal. We take everything so personal. Just get over it. Turn to a neighbor and just say, get over it. That's a word for the day. Get over it. Get over you. Amen. Get, just get over it. And, and just serve God. Amen. Just serve God. How, how, how many have seen the transition of people through your life? And you thought they would stay. They thought they'd be here all this time. Lord God, it, it, don't, don't take it personal. It just, that's life. That's life. But God has purpose. So what are you supposed to Stay connected to the purpose that you know is on the inside of you. The devil knows it, and he's out to abort it any way he can. The devil knows what man does not know. God creates nothing without purpose. God creates nothing without purpose. It's extremely important to understand that you were created by an all-powerful, omnipotent God who cares nothing, who cares nothing about, who creates, excuse me, creates nothing without a unique plan and purpose. Every person has been made complete down to the most intimate detail, body, soul, and spirit. Amen. You see, the devil always wants us to believe what he knows is not true. The world tells you, you don't match up, you don't compare, you're not as good as. Now, I don't care what you compare me to. I'm created in the image and the likeness of God. God knew I was coming. I have a divine destiny on the inside of me. I could care less what you think about me, who I compare with. God says I'm his child. I'm a born again, redeemed child of God. I refuse to be measured and compared to anyone except my God and my Savior. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. But we let the world and we let the lie of the devil push us down. And then we get in comparison. And the next thing you know, he brings along, look, you don't measure up. You need to start feeling sorry for yourself. You need to enter into discouragement. You need to be compressed. And you need to be depressed. And now you need to anesthetize yourself with some substance to keep you from feeling bad about yourself. 
So we enter into addictions and bondages and, 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 and trap, and, and, and we don't have right relationship. So men fall into pornographic uh, 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 bondages in that area. We take alternative substances and trying to somehow ease our emotion instead of rising up. This isn't the will of God for my life. I'm created in the image of God. I refuse to be like this. You see, something inside of me when I was 19 years old, I woke up, strung out on heroin, and I looked into me. I just walked in the same day as every other day, but I walked in the bathroom when I saw myself in the mirror and what I turned myself into. Something inside of me just said, this isn't you. This isn't who you're supposed to be. And not being very smart at 19, the way I decided to change wasn't the way I would recommend for anybody. So I'm struck out on a downer. I just figure I'll get high on an upper. So I went out and shot speed for three days and soaked myself in hot baths and, and stayed up until I eventually passed out. When I woke up, I was no longer addicted to heroin, but I wasn't any smarter. Amen. Amen. But in doing that, but something when I saw myself said, that's not who you are. And every one of you in this room, the devil brings us to places and we keep going along with, but something keeps telling us inside, that's not who you are. And God sends men like me to tell you, you're a divine creation of God. He has purpose for your life. And if you'll just say yes, he'll set you free. And the life and the destiny placed on the inside of you will grow out of you. Worship team will come back. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. The devil isn't fighting against you personally, but against the harvest that God placed inside of you when he created you. The devil cares nothing about you. He cares about what God put in you for his glory. He cares about the harvest that brings about the purpose of God for his glory. That's what he cares about. He cares about you ever finding out that you can sow your life into the soil of the kingdom of God. And that God will begin to water it by the life and the water of his spirit. And that life that's in you that God put inside of you, that nothing will stop it. He can't stop the assignment that's on the inside of you. And he knows that. So the only way he can stop it is either to kill you before you get here. What is the tragedy of abortion? In this nation, over 75 million babies have been aborted since Roe versus Wave. That's 75 million divine destinies. Because a destiny is not just a life. It's not just about your life. It's about a harvest. The devil knows it's not about you. It's about the harvest. It's never just about the seed. It's about what the seed will produce. And so abortion is the abortion of divine destiny. And it's kept the kingdom of God from coming to pass. People say, why has it been 2,000 years? Because man has bought the lie. And the devil's been able to abort destiny after destiny after destiny after destiny after destiny. destiny. And it takes longer and longer because God's still trying to get people to say, hey, I'm the seed of God. I'm a child of God. And I refuse to be talked out of the destiny. Destiny that's on the inside of me. I won't receive counterfeit. I won't receive the lie. I'm going to be the life of God that he created me to be. Stand your feet with me this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So my question is this to you. What has the devil used in your life to bind your harvest and to rob you of the fulfillment of your destiny? It can be as innocent as religion. Religion doesn't produce harvest. It produces a false sense of security. That I'm right with God. But unless I'm sowing my life. Unless I'm invested. Unless I'm dying to myself. If I'm still trying to think of nice things to do for God. Oh, that'd be something nice to do. What is God saying to you? What does he desire to birth out of you? Amen. What has the devil used 
in your life to bind your harvest. Next week we'll get into Luke 13. The woman comes in bound. Bound. Bent over. Crippled. Comes into church. I'm on a mission for this. I hate seeing people bound by the devil. Bound by lies. Bound by restrictions. Bound by intimidations. Bound by counterfeits. Deceptions. God wants his people free. Jesus seeing her bound said, woman, you are loosed. That's the word of the Lord to some of you this morning. God will loose you right now this morning. He'll set you free right now this morning. Right now. It takes an instant. God will set you free. Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. They got mad. What are you doing? Working and healing on the Sabbath. Jesus said, ought not this woman who is a seed. Listen, who is a seed. And a daughter of Abraham. She's she seed from the tree. And because of that, she has a right to be free. Let me take it back even further. Your seed from the original man, Adam. Everybody came out of Adam. And your seed from the original Adam. But that seed got tainted. So God said, this is what I'll do. I'll make you seed from the second Adam. (laughs) Amen. And now, your seed that's free. Seed that's free. is loosed. Because binding is not supposed to be done by the devil. Matthew 18 says, whatever you bind on earth. Is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. We're the ones with the authority. Bow your head to me this morning. I know God, as I was preparing this yesterday and this morning, putting this together, I just felt the Lord tell me that there were those here today that this would be their day to be loose. Jesus' name. You're here today. And you're just tired of the lies, the deception, the counterfeits, and the attack of the enemy on your life to try to abort everything that God created you to be. There are some of you, you're just like me. You, you've had those moments in your life when, when, when you looked at yourself in your own mirror and you knew where you were and you knew inside of yourself that this isn't who I am but how do I break this how do I get out of this some of you you've had that inside of you and and like me you've tried different things but it hasn't really worked and so I tried getting free but I still stayed bound for, for six years after that but then one day I knelt out in a metal chair in a prayer room at New Life Assembly at Jan Arbogan Street in, in Oliver's California and I said Lord I give you my life I'm done. I give you my life from this day on. I will live for you the rest of my life. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll be whatever you ask me to be. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. I'll say whatever you tell me to say. I will live for you the rest of my life. And that moment, everything broke off of my life. This is your moment and this is your day for that to happen right now. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Now, if that's you, I don't care about anything else. I don't care about anybody. You, you, you need to have that same boldness that I have. You need to no longer care about anybody else, anybody else's opinion, nothing else. The only thing that matters is that you know God created you for greater than where you are. His desire for you to be free. And today is your day. If that's you, move from where you are to this altar right now in Jesus' name. Just step out. Come up here right now. Step out right now. Come on. Come on, right now. Right now. There's somebody, I can just come grab you and pull you out. I'm not going to do that. My pull won't make your decision. I can't jog to help you lose weight, and I can't pull you to say yes to God. I can just give you an opportunity. 